So I think the technology is okay. And uh, it's, it's half past. And Ken's got a lot to do today. So um, uh, brush up your brains. <laughs> We need to be sparkly and fresh and um, full of enthusiasm and uh, receptive and with uh, more than anything else, a loving motivation so that we feel we're here for everyone because we're studying these six paramita, these six uh, perfections, which are the way of the Bodhisattva and the Bodhisattva bit by bit is learning to live a life which is more and more for everybody. And uh, the brilliant side of that is the more and more we actually do live for everybody, the lighter and the better our own heart becomes. And we realize how much misery comes from being locked up in self-centeredness. So much. It's a uh, part of so many what Kampopa calls upside down realities. You, know, you would think that by being self-centered, you'd end up better off because you're concentrating on yourself. But in the long term, uh, so much goodness, so much deeper happiness, so much benefit comes through caring for others. So we start with our big mind, including as many beings as we can, and in particular, those who are our own karma, as you know, in this life, whether they harmed us, whether they hurt us, we need to bring them to liberation within ourselves. And so we include them, uh, thinking we're receiving teachings to help all of these beings. We think of everyone with love. We think of the worst people, the most dangerous people, the most harmful people in this world with love and care and thinking if ever we're going to help them long term, it's by our own mind achieving the Buddha's perfect equal love for everybody, everybody from the best to the worst. And then a happy mind. We start with a happy mind because we have Dharma. And as Kim said earlier, when we were just meeting up, uh, in the end, you realize that Dharma is your very best friend, and it's all we have, and it's all that goes with us to the next life, and the next life, and the next life. So happy about that. Really, really happy. And we do some prayers. Sanje chodan soje chonam la, jancho padun dane chapsanche. Dagi jinso jipe sanam je, rola penchera sanje dropare sho. Semchan tamche dewa dang, dewe jodang dem pare joche. Dungal dang, dungal je jodang, tradware joche. Dungal me pe dewa dampa dang, men tradware joche. Nyering chaktang nitan chalwe, tanyong chempola ne parajore chin. De yata shame shamawati shamenta sha trom om kurimam kurimarazite karuta ke ore. Tenzo wati olo yane beshuda ni male malapa naye kukure kaka grase. Grasana o muki para muki a muki shamata ne sawa graha bandana ne ne greta. Sava para prava dina vimukta mara pasha sata pita buddha mudra. Anud gateta sava mare butsarita pare shudde bika santu sava mara kama. Alan sawe lama rinpoche, dage chewara pende tenshola. Kadren chempo gune jezonte, kuson tuje madrup, 
Sato Sol. So, mm -hmm. they say the best played, laid, best played, the best laid plans <laughs> of mice and men. Well, theoretically today we should be starting forbearance, but um, we haven't really finished right conduct. And, you know, the way these six paramita work is they go from the easiest to practice to the hardest, from the most obvious to the most subtle. So it means the first ones, first one, generosity, and then right conduct are where we can start. We can't just start with deep wisdom from one day to the next, but we can start with generosity, a bit being a bit more generous from one day to the next. So it's important that we get the first parameters as good as possible. Now, just to remind you of what we're doing here, is an overview. It's very frustrating for me. I think it might be frustrating for some of you because the beauty is in the details and we don't have time. It's why um, I sent you those study course modules and I hope that through these talks in the overview, you get the main point. What's really behind generosity, all the details of who you give to, how you give, what you give, and then how you give Dharma and how you give your support. And then what we spend a lot of time on, what makes it paramita rather than just generosity? The virtue of generosity or the shravaka virtue of generosity. What makes it paramita? Bodhisattva's generosity, the greatness, the purity. So all of that, You have to do in homework. I just don't have time in one hour to do it justice. So please do go to the backup literature. Now, we saw quite a bit about right conduct last week. The main point is that it's about commitment. The main point about Dharma is that it's about you. It's not about the Buddha's teachings. We're not here to do uh, a BA or an honors or an MA in Buddhist studies. We're here to learn about ourselves, to change ourselves for the better. So the whole point is taking our mind to purity, taking our mind to wisdom, taking our mind to love and compassion. So we saw the paramita of generosity. Whatever the details are, was about letting go of ego because ego is what's coming up the works. It's what's blotting out our pure Buddha, perfect nature. So we learn to give, give up, give up ego and all of the things which go along with ego. And we learn to give our life more and more to others. This is the Bodhisattva's wish. Secret to happiness, to freedom. But then when we give ourselves to others, we saw that automatically you're engaged with other people. So your conduct has to be spot on, as pure and as pure as can be. And it's in engaging with other people and trying to help them that what is that our ego can get in the way so our first can we can see all the paramita as developments of generosity and giving up ego so right conduct you can observe vows you can become a monk or a nun or you can take lay vows you can take the bodhisattva vow you can take tantric initiation but you can do it in an egotistic way. Not just you, not just us disciples. Unfortunately, there are quite a lot of lamas who've gone wonky, 
because it's gone to their head. So even though they are very versant, conversant with Dharma, they can teach it well. And even though they might have done years in retreat, basically, if it's all about me, 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 something's gone very wrong. So right conduct in the details is all those lists of these vows, that vows, the, it gets complicated, but we can see one can take three sorts of vows. It's what we saw last time. Vows that prevent us hurting, hurting ourselves and hurting others. They're called pratimoksha or self-liberation vows. Often it's the monastic ordinations, lay precepts and so on. We can take vows where we promise to do the right things to develop our mind, like meditation. We take meditation commitments. And we can take vows to help others, to bring benefit for others. But the essence of this right conduct is, as Milarepa said, and we'll come back to that, you are authentic. There's no hidden agenda. You have what Taisitupa says often these days, he uses this word integrity. So that as we are doing all these wonderful things, you know, taking refuge, lay precepts, bodhisattva vow, vajrayana commitments, all the time, the main point is that we are not deceiving ourselves or others and using our Buddhism to nurture ego rather than get rid of it. We need a sincere, authentic love and compassion. That's what it's all about. We must keep, must keep that in mind. Now, last time I should, although we can't go into the details, I do want to read to you some a couple of lists that you'll find in Kampopa. Because if you remember last week, we saw that right conduct is in three areas. It's stopping the harm. I just mentioned them, stopping the harm, improving one's whole being, and helping others. So last week I spoke a bit about precepts, monastic vows, which are the first one how we say no to the things that cause damage, the things based in the mind poisons and the actions which are harmful, harmful actions. So now I want to read you this list. So at least you've got a transmission. It's from a text called the Bodhisattva Levels. And um, so, it's the second right conduct, right conduct as amassing. I like that, amassing. You know, you've got heaps. You've got heaps of them. Right conduct, good conduct. You're doing the right thing. You're doing good things. You're using your life day after day in a very healthy way. So it says, um, so Bodhisattva Bhumi is a text from the Asanga tradition. It's based on the Buddha's teaching, of course, but mainly due to Asanga's brother, Vasubandhu, who was most brilliant scholar and who put a lot of Asanga's teachings into format, formula. The following is to be understood as being the Bodhisattva right conduct of amassing what is virtuous. It is to apply oneself enthusiastically. We'll come to that uh, next week, I hope. Enthusiastically to study, to contemplation, to meditation, and to taking time for retreat. It is to respect gurus and to serve them and to serve and care for the sick. It is to give excellently and to only proclaim the good qualities of other, to appreciate their attributes, to be forbearing of those who are scornful of you, 
is to dedicate every virtue to enlightenment and to make deep and earnest prayers to that end. It is to make offerings to the three most precious refuges, to strive to be diligent, to be ever caring, mindful, and careful, to be very mindful of the Dharma training, and through awareness of the need to keep to it, to guard the doors of one's senses, and know how much one should consume. Ho, oh, ho, 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 just that one line for these days of consumer mentality and adverts wherever you turn. Not to sleep in the first and last parts of the night, but to persevere in joining one's mind with what is wholesome. To rely on holy beings and Dharma teachers and to examine one's own delusions. To admit them and get rid of them. These sort of dharmas, he says, need to be practiced. Not just known about, practiced. They need to be nurtured and brought to their maturity. So that is a lovely list of sort of what we can be doing with respect to ourselves. And then in the same text, we get a list of 13 aspects of working for the welfare of others. First, to support other people who are doing worthwhile things. Two, to remove the sufferings of beings who are in torment. Three, to teach those who lack skill how to cope intelligently. Four, to appreciate what has been done and to bring benefit in return. Now, this one means in particular to those who've helped us, our parents, our teachers, parents who gave us this life and so on, it's to know how to repay their kindness. To protect beings from what frightens them. Number six, to help remove the distress of those who are suffering. Number seven, to provide the needy with the provisions they lack. Then the next ones, there for when you become a Dharma teacher to very properly bring together your Dharma following, to engage each of them in what really corresponds to their needs, their aspirations, their mentality. Number 10, to make them happy through yourself having the very finest of qualities. Number 11, to help them excellently annihilate whatever needs annihilating from themselves. Number 12, this is when you get uh, quite a bit of way uh, down the path and you can do extraordinary things to inspire or through your exceptional abilities. And number 13, to help them long for what is good and wholesome. So if you look at um, Gampopa's teachings or in the module that you're sent, you'll see there's more. After that, we get some very, very down to earth advice about uh, everyday behavior with our body, like us not making a noise when you close doors or when you move a chair, don't make it scrape the ground and don't eat with your mouth open because it's not pleasant for other people and all sorts of uh, things about mindfulness and good conduct. Let me just, give me just a second. Okay, that's good. And so, with right conduct, as with generosity, as with all the paramita, we need to know how to make it paramita. That was the very first talk in this practice bodhisattva sessions. Remember, you make it great, great through three things. Noble, through primordial wisdom, jhana, 
where you realize the non-triplicity of what's going on as you practice right conduct. So, I mean, this is really the deep point. Non-triplicity means me, there's really no me, no other, no interaction. It's about the whole point of all of our practice bodhicitta of going beyond ego, getting rid of the delusions of ego. So applying as much jhana as we can, that makes it great through being as noble as it can be, as wise as it can be. We make it great in extent because our relative mind, whatever we're doing in right conduct, is thinking of all sentient beings and their suffering and removing it. And so beings are endless and what we can wish for them in this world, beyond this world, wishing dharma for them, and so on and so on. The wishes are endless. So prajna makes it great in terms of endless magnitude. Sometimes we use the uh, Shamantabhadra prayer of multiplying clouds of offerings, clouds of goodness. One cloud becomes thousands. Each one of the thousand becomes thousands more. So we can make a tiny action, like giving somebody something simple in our mind. It's endless, bringing endless benefit to so many beings. And at the same time, the jhana shows the non-duality, the non-triplicity. And then when it's done, third, we make it great through dedication. Three things make it great. And then two things make it pure. Two things in perfect harmony. Wisdom and compassion, the compassion as much as we can. Limitless compassion, great compassion. And then the wisdom in that case were the four seals, the four stamps of Dharma, where we realize the uh, voidness of your own body, your own mind, the action you're doing, and the end result, which is Buddhahood. So whatever right conduct we're practicing, we do with that. Now, Gampopa's text, which you have as your backup resource, and also more generally, when we study the six paramitas, bodhisattva practice, we are doing Mahayana studies. That's all we need to know, the classic Mahayana teachings. But then, because we are who we are and we're involved with what we're involved with, we're engaged in this very special aspect of Mahayana, which we call Vajrayana or Tantra. So that's not in Gampapa, or is mentioned in a few words. But in terms of right conduct, then in Vajrayana, beside the right conduct of vows and the right conduct of the bodhisattva. We have tantric commitments, often known under the word samaya. Samaya in Tibetan is tamsik. Tam means sacred, and sik means literally words, but actually it means promise. Sacred promise, sacred commitment. Traditionally, I can't say for these days because things have changed very much, but traditionally, for almost 2,000 years, 1,500, 1,600 years, Vajrayana or Tantra has always been about what goes on between a guru and a disciple. It's very personal. And so Vajrayana Samaya, or commitment, is given by the guru to the disciple according to the disciple's own character and needs. As Jamgon Kontro, the first tells us very clearly in his instructions for um, Guru Yoga. He says, it means doing 
whatever your guru has told you to do. But more than that, whether they actually said it or not, you know, with your lawyer present taking notes, <laughs> guru said that these were exactly his words. No, he didn't say that. He said this so that you've got a kind of contract you can get out of. It says, don't only do what your guru tells you to do. Do what you know your guru would like you to do. That's a very hard one. There's not really a get out clause for that. <laughs> and um, so everything that the Vajrayana teachings and our own guru has transmitted to us, the essence is there. If we go outside the essence to the form, then each practice, because Vajrayana is about a transmission usually through practice, whether it be like Tara practice, Chimrezic practice, Vajra Yogini practice, or Mahamudra or Dzogchen practice, each practice has its own set, <coughs> excuse me, of Samaya. So when you receive the empowerment, and then afterwards the instructions, you receive the small print. You know, now you've received this, this is what you have to do. And very often in the past, <clears throat> excuse me, like I said, not these days, but there will be a practice commitment, which was very, very, very serious. <coughs> and <clears throat> you would need to do your practice no matter what. I mean, unless you were very, very ill or unless your guru <coughs> said, give you a break. <laughs> And said, no, no, you can you know, take seven weeks off while you do this or whatever. So I can't tell you about them. All I can say is what all my teachers say, which was what I just said. But that in general, very famously, as the centuries and all the different practices have gone by, there are 14 pretty much common Vajrayana Tantric Samayas commitments that if you are truly engaged in the Vajrayana path, you should know about and honor. Okay, we can't go there this morning because Vajrayana, this, this today is not about Vajrayana. And once we get there, it gets very, very tricky because so much has changed since Vajrayana came to the West. Empowerments aren't given often with commitment. They're given as what's called a blessing to make a connection. They're not given expecting everyone who takes them to do the practice at least once a day, every day or whatever it is. So it's kind of, uh, you know, like Coca-Cola light. It's, it's Vajrayana light. There's no expectation that if you've received empowerment, you have a profound commitment to that guru. You die for that person or whatever. That's not given anymore. But in the past, it was because in the past, in the distant past, where all this came from in India, before Vajrayana came into the monasteries and became a system, people went to their guru and they were with their guru 24-7. They had given up everything. They'd even given up monastic life just to work sincerely, intensely, on their own mind. So then those commitments were like the absolute, absolute rules for what you must do. So anyway, these days we need to know things are different. So we need to just, so there are no modern rules. <laughs> it's a mess. <laughs> it's a mess. Uh, and that's good because everyone will be breaking Vajrayana Samaya. It's so hard, so hard to keep. And none of the good teachers I know expect you to keep it unless you're in long retreat or unless you really have extraordinary karma and are able to keep it. They are making connections. But anyway, it's another topic. Now, still on right conduct, Let's come back to something that I shared with you at the beginning. And that's a general guideline. 
you need to know. So it's all about commitment on those three levels to protect yourself, to develop goodness, to help others, and then including the Vajrayana Samaya. In every instance, we need to know first how to receive our commitment from the lineage so that we've connected with the sacred blessing of that commitment. We need to know how to do that. Now, these days with COVID and with the fact that really good, reliable, true lineage holders who have not messed up, they're very far, few and far between. It's not easy, even these days, to go and get a refuge ceremony or to take the Bodhisattva vow or to take precepts. So uh, that's changing ground as well. It seems, according to some of our teachers, that now we can take refuge in the proper way, but on our own, in front of a shrine, or with some help you know, from somebody like me who won't give you refuge as a sort of a, you know, some big shot, but who could stand beside you and take you through the ceremony so you take refuge. Same with bodhisattva vow and precepts as well. We can take them in all sincerity as our Buddha and our guru was right there in front of us. So this is changing, very necessary with the COVID that it be like that. So we need first of all to know how to receive the vow. Then from the outset, we need to know what will break it so we don't. And then we need to know what might damage it, even if it's not broken, what will weaken it and where we will need. So we need to know that. And then we need to know how to fix it if it goes wrong. Some vows, when they're broken, we can restore. Others, traditionally, like monks and nuns vows, you only get one shot at it. And if you break it, that's it for this life. You can't take those vows again. Bodhisattva vow, then we can restore it if it's broken, but we need to restore it. Otherwise, all the actions we do until it's restored aren't bodhisattva actions. They don't have the power. They don't have the uh, oomph, the juice, the blessing. So we need to know how to restore. And then we need to know how to strengthen whatever commitment we've taken. So if you remember, those of you who are with me for the aspiration bodhicitta teachings, we looked at five areas, how not to lose the aspiration and so on, but then also how to make it stronger. So in general, with all the vows, how to take them, what breaks or weakens them, how to fix them if it goes wrong, and then how to make it better, how to make it stronger and stronger. So once we're practicing the paramita of right conduct, then the benefits are twofold, ultimate and relative. Ultimately, well, you'll become a Buddha. That's the good news. In the meantime, however long that takes, then your right conduct, even though primarily you're not looking for that, remember right conduct's about not being devious, no own agenda, whether you're looking for it or not, your life will be resourceful. You will have the material benefits, you will have the friends, you will have the good reputation and so on, that all our relative reality, strengths, resources 
that make you able to help more and more beings. And we saw in the list uh, about, uh, you know, how to gather, gather the right sort of disciples, gather them in the right way, and then make yourself inspiring and excellent. Your own right conduct will do that. Doesn't it make sense? It's so sensible. If you're a truly good person, full of qualities, then people will be drawn to you and you'll really have something wholesome, healthy to share with them. So let's go back to Milarepa. And Milarepa, remember the two songs I sent you? I think I mentioned the one to the Tantrika last week, somebody who was uh, you know, doing prayers and pujas for people. Now, the other one is quite interesting. At one point, there were, Milarepa was staying somewhere, and there were three scholars who were kind of three famous scholars locally, three pillars of the Dharma, excellent in their conduct, very wise, widely read in their knowledge. And they'd heard about this guy, Milarepa. Um, who the hell is he? And does he really know anything? And people are really attracted to him. They keep going up there and coming back and going, wow, you know, the blessing. Is this guy a charlatan? And so there's two things going on. If you look at the surface and what they're saying, it's we've got to protect our local population in case this guy is just a charlatan who is you know, misleading people. Behind the scenes, they were losing customers. <laughs> and so They were losing customers. <laughs> so uh, they decided they'd go up and see Milarepa, pretty certain that he uh, didn't really have a grip on Dharma because he'd never really studied that much and so on. So they thought that they'd talk about Dharma and he'd be so ashamed. He'd just pack his tiny bag. He didn't have lots of bags and go somewhere else. But their real motivation was to get rid of him because they were no longer the stars of the show, seems like. So they go up, and there's three of them. Two of them are really protagonists, and they try and sort of out-argue him, test him, and they don't succeed. So they're getting fed up. They're getting angry with this. And one of them says, ah, this is just all magic tricks. And OK, you know how to do this and do that. But you don't really know Dharma. But there's one of them who's starting to have doubts and think maybe this guy's really got it. His name was Dalo. And he became a very, very good disciple of Milarepa afterwards. So the very short six parameters I sent you comes from a slightly longer song, but it's addressed to those scholars. Now, there, Milarepa doesn't need to talk like he did to the Tantrika to tell him the main points about generosity, right conduct, forbearance. They know these. They're Buddhist scholars. They've studied this back to front. They teach it. They know the details. So what he does and is so useful for us. With each paramita, he puts his finger on the essence. Other than me, 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 there is no generosity. It's not about giving this, giving that, giving Dharma teachings on a throne that's set up like this and this. All those details is, yeah, of course. But the whole point is you're getting rid of ego. And then he said uh, other, let me see what I wrote. So it's the same as what you've got. Other than ending deceit and hypocrisy. There is no paramita of right conduct. So he embarrassed them because he made, he made it crystal clear why you've come here is jealousy and to get rid of me and because you're attached to your disciples 
and the power and the prestige you have. And uh, so anyway. So now we need to go on to forbearance, the paramita, perfection of forbearance. Tsundru in Tibetan and Santi in um, Sanskrit, something like that. It starts with KS. I'm not got a clue how they pronounce that. And it's a language that died and came back. So nobody knows really. Um, so anyway, now in English, I translate this as forbearance. Very often you will find it translated as patience. Patience. I don't like the translation patience because if I see the word patience, I think of sitting in a waiting room somewhere. Like you go to the doctors and you just have to sort of sit there and wait and grin and bear it. It's nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with that. You know, you can practice forbearance in split seconds. It's not a question of waiting for something to change, of being able to just bide your time. So forbearance has the word bear in it. And the Tibetan, when it's unpacked linguistically, etymologically, it says the ability to carry. It's why for the advert for this course, I showed this Nepali porter who has this huge, huge, amazing load on his back as they do there. And they know how to carry it, they can manage. So it's defined as an ability to bear. We'll come to the definition more precisely in a few seconds. But forbearance is my preferred translation for this paramita. The actual definition is this. Sit back, put on your safety belts. It's quite something. An ability to cope with anything. Cope with anything. Whatever happens to you, you can cope. You can manage. Now, I'm very far from that myself. I don't know about you, but I imagine we could safely say that we're all pretty far from it. And you know, we can cope with some things, but we certainly do have limits. So now we're going deeper. Each parameter goes deeper, and it, it's a fascinating journey into the very heart of what's going on. So there you are. Let's imagine it's all working. You're more and more generous, less and less self-centered, less egotistic, more and more living a life of service to others. And then in doing that, you've discovered all the temptations for ego, for being a somebody, a helper, and then how, as we see all over the world, what starts off as kind actions to help somebody can end up as terrible actions to exploit them. It's terrible, but it's, it's what often happens. So you, you've realized right conduct, and you have right conduct, and you're helping more and more people more and more purely. Now there's a problem, two problems. One is that life out there is not under your control. The people you're helping, the situations you're in, wasn't designed to make you feel comfortable. It's totally different. It's other people's karma. So you can't expect it to go the way you expected, the way you wanted, the way you project it. And then people you help can be difficult. They can be ungrateful. The help itself can go very wrong. You can get disappointed. So that's one thing. Once we are really given to others and trying to be selfless, then uh, things aren't going to go according to plan. And very often they will be upsetting. Upsetting. Take note of this word. It's really what forbearance is about. Whatever upsets you. 
whatever upsets you. So that's one thing. The second thing is you're on a Dharma path. You're practicing these six perfections to become Buddha, to overcome your ego. I mentioned it most every week. Ego is terrible. It's a survivor. So, so tricky. How do you think ego survived hundreds, thousands of lifetimes, and it's still there now, despite everything we've done? It's so tricky. Knows all the tricks, all of them. So when we practice Dharma, and this is something to really think about because it's at one point the reality of this will come home and you might feel you, you have choices to make. When we practice Dharma, the very nature of what we're doing rearranges our karma and accelerates the bringing on of stuff, our difficult karma, our harmful karma from the past. So we should expect life to become interesting. You've made a dangerous decision. You're going to sort out your mind and all of its history and everything it carries from all of those lives so that it's clean and pure and kind and perfect. This is what it's about. It's not about practicing some parameters out there. It's about sorting yourself out. out. So you can say, oh, I'm not going there. But then if you don't go there, what happens is your harmful karma from the past will take you to trouble in your rebirths. Bad rebirths, or even if you get a human rebirth, sickness, poverty, war, whatever it will be. If we can purify that karma while we have a precious human existence here, and while out there we have the refuges and our teachers and the Dharma, and we connect those two so that we're practicing, then it's said, it's not me who says it, it's what I've been told, that what might be a very painful life, a whole life as an animal, as a human, could be experienced as a few days of headache, for instance or some other physical illness. So the illness is horrible. But if we believe the teachings, that's our opportunity to save ourselves so much, so much horror in the future. And we're so used to our precious human existence, we don't realize what this opportunity we have. We've been so used to it since we were born. We don't have the Buddhist perspective where you see, look, can there? compared with the billions of sentient beings around him, has got all of this dharma, has got an opportunity to purify. The others don't. They don't have dharma. They're just living out their karma. So we must expect our dharma path to bring on our more difficult karma. At the same time, it will bring on resources so that we're equipped to cope with what's happening to us. It's not a dark journey. It's an intelligent, you know, it's like what we do in our house. Sometimes you think, I've got to roll my sleeves up and have a good clean out. You know, you're breathing dust. You're doing a lot of hard work. But it's really worthwhile. So when we are practicing Dharma, because now we have generosity, now we are developing right conduct, then we must expect difficulties, and not just difficulties out there, but difficulties that will trigger in us what we have to face in this lifetime as darkness inside ourselves, so that we can get rid of it forever. So when it says forbearance is the ability to cope, then it's the ability to cope with all those things. The difficulties of out there, 
and the difficulties inside our own mind experience of who we are, our hopes, our fears, our own karma, what it's bringing on to us in terms of our life, the experiences day after day. And although we're trying our very best to help others in that life, there will be many things to face. So forbearance that we need to develop is the ability to cope. In the traditional teachings, first we look at what is life without forbearance? What is life with forbearance? It's called the benefits and the shortcomings. So So the word that comes up in the text is hostility or anger. But we need to know what this covers, covers a lot of things. But what it says is, if you have anger, then you're living a very dangerous life. Because you can get upset at any time. And depending on how upset you get, that can destroy everything. It says even virtue that's been developed over tens, hundreds of lifetimes could be destroyed in a few moments of anger. Anger as a general term. So then, I can't remember which they used to say, anger or hostility, let's put it, I think it's a better term, hostility. When you're hostile to something, it makes you uncomfortable, you don't like a hostility or someone. So hostility is like an atom bomb. Now, he said this in the early days, you know, the 70s, we were still in the nuclear bomb scare time. When we first designed Samiling Temple, it had a uh, bomb-proof shelter underneath it. Uh, in the end, we couldn't afford it. But um, the threat of atomic war was felt to be so strong at the time. And the local planning officers in Dumfries Council, when I went, I, it was me who took the plans, they said, what do you people know that we don't know? You know, that you're building a temple, but with a, a, a bomb-proof shelter underneath. And so anyway, Atom bombs were very big in people's minds at the time. But he said, inside you, you carry a bomb that could destroy anything. Now, this isn't just clever speak. You know, your old Ken has had a long Dharma career. <laughs> all my life, since the age of 23, I'm 74 now. I've been all the time in Dharma centers and traveling and meeting thousands of people. And one of the saddest things is this, is that through getting upset, I've seen people completely lose Dharma, go off, change radically. It's one of the saddest things. And it can happen. And when it happens, you know, what hostility does is it makes us see other through very angry and critical eyes. It's why one of the great bodhisattva teachings is to learn to see everyone through loving eyes and to only see the goodness in our fellow beings. Because when our mind is challenged, we tend to blame and criticize others. And that can become very, very poisonous. In Vajrayana, people will see faults in their gurus. It's really their own faults, but the guru becomes like a mirror, and that can become very sad. So anger or hostility is said to be the most dangerous thing of all the mind poisons, because in a few seconds, so much can be destroyed. Now, of course, if we, it's one of the reasons we dedicate whatever virtue we do, then nothing can destroy it. But if somebody has been a good person, not dedicating their goodness, but that just becomes who they are. Their whole mind can change. 
they can cause themselves so much damage. I I meet people with illness, with chronic sickness and things wrong. And sometimes it seems, or from what my teachers say, you know, maybe it was just a few seconds where they harmed somebody else in a past life. They damaged, but with such a vicious mind that that comes back as years and years of suffering. So hostility is a terrible thing and we need to get rid of it. So it says there is no poison worse than hostility, anger. And there is no virtue greater than forbearance, which is its remedy. And this is really frustrating because forbearance teachings are some of the richest, most hands-on, practical, wonderful teachings you'll find in the Mahayana teachings. And of course, we don't have time for, for them. Uh, they're in your backup material. We've got the uh, ninefold Shantideva system dealing, dealing with hostility. And we've got the fivefold Asanga system through those two main lineages of Mahayana. We get so much good advice about tackling hostility from every angle. Now, so the definition is we are cultivating an ability to cope. So to cope with what? You don't need to cope with good times. If we just enjoy them, we can use them in a Buddhist way by wishing everybody such happiness and even more. You know, we can share our happy mind with others, but we don't need to cope with good times. What do we need to cope with is adversity, difficulty, difficulty. So in the Bodhisattva teachings, I'm sure you've come across them in seven point mind training and other, then and in Shantideva's Bodhisattva way of life, then, um, and this is weird. If you're really a Bodhisattva, you learn to welcome adversity. You're not a masochist. And Akron Rinpoche used to say, no, don't go out there making trouble just so you can practice being a bodhisattva. <laughs> he said, there's no need. Life will bring you plenty enough trouble to practice your muscles of forbearance. So uh, you don't need to go and uh, make it. Um, so adversity, and the Bodhisattva welcomes adversity because how else are you going to develop the strength? You think, oh, oh no, what a hassle. Oh, this is horrible. You know, life's doing this to me. This person's doing this to me. Normally, people feel sorry for themselves. People think it's unfair or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. The Bodhisattva thinks this is wonderful because if I can learn to cope with this, then when worse and more difficult adversary comes, I'd already be developing my muscle uh, a little bit. You know, it's like muscles. You can't suddenly go and have big muscles. You have to use little weights and then bigger weights and do a little bit of exercise and a bit more exercise. And bit by bit and bit by bit, you get fitter and stronger. And you can do things you couldn't do before because you're stronger. So forbearance is like this. So when it's, oh, no, here we go again. And life brings you difficult people, difficult health, difficult social circumstances, family circumstances. Then as the Bodhisattva, a little thing lights up in your heart. You take a deep breath and you summon up courage because this is what it's all about. If I can be strong and happy here. Now, this takes us to the next paramita, which is how to be happy doing all of that. Not just, oh, bloody hell, you know, here we go again. Another bodhisattva challenge. But not quite whoopee, but kind of inside. You know, this life's passing. 
When I was a kid at school, I was the shortest kid in the class. My gym teacher, it was an all boys traditional school, been there 250 years. Some of the teachers looked like they'd been there 250 years too. My gym teacher was a sadist, a very angry sadist. And every time I couldn't do something, he'd hit me and send me back to do it again. I couldn't do it. This big thing, this vaulting horse that you have to run up and jump over the top of, I just crashed into it. And so it hit me and sent me back and try again. I used to have such fear of the gym sessions because every time it will be like hell. But then I thought I learned to think in three quarters of an hour's time, it's over. And there's only another lesson this week, you know, two or three a week. But really, this life is like that. Whatever it throws at you, your partner, your children, your parents, your work, your health, your own body, whatever is adversity, it will go. It will go. But if you can deal with it joyfully, skillfully, peacefully, lovingly, kindly. Then, not only are you purifying the karma that made it, so it won't come back in another life as something horrible, even much, much, much worse, but you are making your strong bodhisattva mind. And once you get it, once the penny drops, and once you've exercised forbearance a little bit, then it will really make your bodhisattva mentality much deeper so that's kind of the essence of it we're learning to cope <clears throat> now adversity and then that makes us hostile it's more than it seems of course some things make us angry we've got the obvious anger we're angry at somebody we're angry at circumstances we're angry at the government we're angry at even our own karma because it gives us ill health, it gives us poverty, it gives us whatever it gives us. So there's that, of course. But then there's a much slower burning version where generally we're irritated day after day by our circumstances. We're uncomfortable. It's this discomfort that we're really looking at. Big discomfort, small discomfort. We're not in harmony with what's happening. We're not using everything. It's a beautiful Dharma opportunity. We are wishing it will go away. We are uncomfortable. And that makes us tense. It can make us despondent. So we lose our courage. We think this is never going to work. If it's bodhisattva activity or you're trying, you're trying, you don't get obvious results in your meditation in your efforts to be a kind person, make your human relationships better. For all the effort, all the kindness, all the love you put into it, it doesn't work. So we can come to hate ourselves. We can come to a state of great self-pity, which is very, very, very powerful. It kind of undermines you, poisons you from deep inside. When we look at what's at the heart of that self-pity, we find this inability to cope with adversity, the adversity brought about by our own karma. So the bodhisattva mind gives us courage. But anyway, we're not just looking at anger, you know, obvious anger obvious upset. It's whatever disturbs your mind, whatever disturbs your mind. What's the opposite of disturbed? You're at peace. You're at peace with yourself. You're at peace with other people. You're at peace with what's happening to you, and your health and your life circumstances. It's easy for me to say, very easy. But now we've gone deeper and deeper into Dharma. We're seeing what the essence, getting closer to the essence. So we have three, so now we come to 
we've had the definition, an ability to cope. Usually after the definition, then we get categories. You now with generosity, it's a generosity of material generosity and giving our strength to others, our friendship, companionship. And then third, giving the Dharma, we had three. With right conduct, we had three categories. Getting rid of the harm, developing the virtue, helping others. And now with, uh, uh, with forbearance, we have three areas of learning to cope. They're very real. One is from out there, learning to cope with what is not you, what other people, what life is bringing to you that makes you uncomfortable, that's hostile. All of that happens through our karma. And so learning to cope with that is where most of the nine methods from Shantideva, from Shantideva, from Nagarjuna, and the um, five methods from Maitreya, Asanga, then very often giving us advice about dealing with life's difficulties. If you know seven point mind training, then you'll know uh, that the third point of the seven is about making adversity the path. Very big topic. But mainly it's about adversity as most people define it. When for them, life has gone wrong. For us, the Bodhisattva, practicing the parameter, life is offering us a wonderful opportunity. Whatever is bringing you is called the enemy, but it doesn't need to be a person. Whatever is bringing you the adversity becomes your most valued friend, becomes your guru. And instead of saying shit, I'm sorry, for whatever we say, we say thank you. Thank you for bringing me this opportunity. And really, that's what we're aiming for. Not sort of, yeah, you know, thank you very much you know, for bringing me this bodhisattva <laughs> opportunity. You're wonderful. <laughs> It's really something deep inside you feels. So there's a story, and it's, it's told so often, I forget the name, but it was a Geshe who'd gone into retreat. Let's go through it quickly. You've probably heard it. Uh, he was loved and respected by the people in his village, in the monastery, and he decided that because the six paramita are the very essence of bodhisattva practice, he'd go into retreat and he would spend one year on each which is what he did. And then at one point in his retreat, uh, there was a, I, I don't, there wasn't knock knock at the door. Somebody just burst in. So I don't know if he was in a walled up cave or whatever he was in, but he'd been alone for one couple of years. His food was brought and left outside or he had enough to cook for himself, not seen anybody. Then all of a sudden somebody comes bursting in through the door. He's completely taken aback. You know, he's been meditating every day, all day long. It's quite a shock. And he said, no, get out, get out, get out, get out. I'm in retreat, I'm in retreat. I'm not supposed to see anybody. Please go away. So the guy who burst in sits down and says, yeah, sure, sure. You know, we all know this one, yeah. Pretty cool, huh? You get fed. You get people's respect. You just sit here. You don't have to do anything. Don't have to work. Uh, pretty cool number. No, you've probably got lots of lovely food they're giving you. So what have you got? I'm starving. And so then the Geshe says, no, no, you don't understand. I meditate. I'm meditating for the good of all sentient beings. And I must keep my retreat. So for goodness sake, please get out. And then, then the guy said, come on, do me a favor. We all know what a hypocrite you are. We all do this. It's, I mean, the people here, they're just stupid. As soon as they see you in your retreat, they'll give you anything you want. So he says, so what have you got? You got any meat? And then, and then the guy, in the end, the Geshe gets so wound up that he actually forcibly has to evict, push the person out. 
So while he's doing that, and the guy turns around and said, by the way, what are you practicing just now? And then the Geshe suddenly stops. The paramita of forbearance. The guy looks at him. Yeah, so? <laughs> oh, then he realizes that this guy is in fact a very wise yogi who's tweaked the whole situation and he can see what's missing because otherwise the guy's going to end up after six years, he'll go down, he'll be famous. His ego will be even worse than it was before. And so he actually teaches him forbearance. Anyway, this is one of the classic stories. So we have our categories of forbearance. First, dealing with stuff brought to you from what is not you, other people's circumstances. Secondly, dealing with the difficulties brought about by the fact that you're practicing Dharma. So this is not coming from other people, it's coming from your choice of practicing Dharma. And then the third area is forbearance of shunyata, voidness, emptiness. Forbearance of shunyata, where this is not just the difficulties brought about by your Dharma practice, it's about the deep difficulty of your mind to accept no self, to accept non-duality, to accept the crumbling of one of your delusions after another. As your traditional story of me collapses. Remember, all of the parameter can be seen as a development of generosity, giving up ego and as ego falls apart then uh, it's very funny i feel like quoting something i don't like <laughs> it's a it's a quotation from chujan trumpa rinpoche and uh, i don't like his writing a lot i mean some of his writing is brilliant but he's also got an edge to it whereas uh, i don't like but anyway there's one thing he says, and it's, you've seen it everywhere. He says, uh, the bad news, you're falling from an aeroplane without a parachute. The good news, there's no ground. <laughs> so it kind of conveys a flavor. Um, so the more ego collapses, the more we don't have the reference, the more shunyata there is, the more the reference points, the way our mind has structured reality so we can cope. So we can cope within our samsara. We must expect that to dissolve and dissolve. And then we'll be without reference points. We won't have a little manual in, you know, that tells you, Ken, this is happening to you today. This is what you need to do for the best or for the worst. So coping with shunyata, deep inside our mind in meditation, is the third forbearance and it's the most important it's the most important so when the Geshes came to Milarepa and they were testing him and he knew they knew all about the details of the paramita when he puts his finger on the very essence of um, forbearance then he says other than not fearing not fearing absolute truth there's no other forbearance so when it comes down to it all of our training in forbearance is all there so that we can become aware of the truth nothing exists in its own right not you not me not anything that's the way everything Thing is it changes every split second it's a huge web of interdependence and impermanence and a yogi yogi can knows that can cope with it 
can cope with it, the ability to cope with anything. So whatever that brings as internal experience, external experience, forbearance is ultimately forbearance or shunyata, which is impermanence and interdependence. So we have those three areas. And uh, the first one, dealing with difficulty that comes from the outside, then please do the homework and look at the ninefold way. It's really, really wonderful. Really wonderful because it's not like one solution for dealing with difficulty. It approaches it from external angles, internal angles. It's like it's like something I did once. I remember I got kind of a transmission on this. In the early, early years at Samiling, I was had to take out a tree root. It was a big had been a big pine. And Samiling needed a, I mean, it's not very environmentally friendly, but we needed a bigger oil tank. <laughs> so in order to position the oil tank, a tree had to go. They'd been cut down, but then just realized the root had to go to a big root. So I was set to that job with another guy who shall remain nameless, um, who wasn't very good with a pickaxe. So you had to be look all the time because he just wasn't a born pickaxe, so he wasn't very mindful. And so we were working on this root. It took days and days and days and days of digging manually to get it out. And Akon Rimte will come along from time to time with a lovely little smile, see how we were getting on, lend a hand, uh, sometimes be, I remember once he put his hand in the dirt and brought out a bulb and said, oh, make flour. And so he took it away to plant somewhere. But what he showed us was that you don't just, you need to think, you know, you can dig a bit here, you they can then pull it with ropes a bit with a very tiny tractor that we had. No, uh, an Austin Champ army vehicle. You could do all sorts of things and gradually by working on it, in the end, the whole thing came out. Forbearance is like that. The ninefold system deals with a very stereotyped example of somebody is aggressive towards you. And it's about not getting upset and aggressive back. Because it's, that's what's been keeping the whole of samsara going. I hurt you, so you hurt me, and then I hurt you back, and then it's endless. And all the other mind poisons. So we need to stop the process where we don't hurt back anymore. Instead, we practice forbearance, serenity, compassion. So this brings up lots and lots of things. But anyway, we think of things like, you know, I don't want to carry on making karma with you. And if I get angry back at you, if I manage to hurt you, like you feel you need hurting with words, with deeds, then what am I doing? I'm effectively bringing you back with more hassles next time around. It's stupid. So we, even though through habit, we tend to get upset and want to hurt, something realizes the stupidity of it. And then behind another thing of the nine is you think, as we always do when we're angry, you're wrong. But then if I get upset, why am I getting upset at you? Why am I being hostile to you? Because you're being hostile to me. You're hostile. I'm hostile. If I think you're wrong, then I have to think I'm wrong now because I've become hostile. Do you really want to be somebody you feel disgusted about, like you're critical about? Or do you want to be somebody you can be proud of because you remain calm? You realize the power of karma. And then advice like, you know, if somebody hits you with a stick, do you get angry at the person or the stick? Because in the end, it's the stick that hurts you. you know? Of course, you don't get angry at the stick. You get angry at the person who waves the stick. So like that, somebody who hurts you is like the stick. 
they are wielded by their karma, not just by their karma, by your karma together. So are you angry at the person or are you angry at what is manipulating all of this harm coming to you? And if you are upset at that, then what are you going to do about it? You're going to tackle the very root of hostility by becoming ahimsa, someone who would never harm anymore. That's how we take away our harmful karma, by becoming harmless and so on. Nine beautiful teachings that we don't just learn. We sit down, we think about them very, 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 very deeply and see such good heartedness, such wonderful sense in those teachings. So anyway, I have to stop there for this morning. We carry on with forbearance uh, next week. And uh, I want to give a little bit of time for discussion. So let's dedicate whatever was good today. Sonam diye tamche zikpani, tomne ne pedranam pamchene, jega na jipalap, truk paye, sipe tsule, drowa drowa resho. Jan chub semcho remboche, ma jepanam. Jai Jorji, Jai Pa Nyampa Me Padam, Kongne, Kongdu, Belwara Shoh.